And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest for this evening, who will share a story from her memoir in progress. Friends, I give you Barbara Andres. Hi, <laughs> I'm Barbara Andres, an actor. Fortunately, I've worked for the wonderful Two River Theater Company who is presenting tonight. And some of you may or uh, have seen me uh, in four years ago, I remember Mama. I was Mama. This great artistic family continues to fulfill their season with such a wide range of projects as we await the return, God bless, of live theater. And I'm very, very happy and honored to be part of that journey tonight. But I wanna take a minute to thank you for tuning in on this significant day in American history as there are other things to watch and I appreciate your being with me. Everyone has a story and I decided a while ago it might be valuable to tell mine because it shares the complicated life of an actor alongside the very complicated real life of that person. So before we dive in, I thought some of my background might fill in a few potholes of the story as I read. I was almost born in a trunk with show business parents and they were headliners in the stage show late vaudeville era. I grew up literally backstage from the age of three weeks on from 1939 through 1945, all during World War II. Big bands, dressing rooms, hotel rooms, restaurants, beautiful trains, and no other kids. I roamed the country with the Andrews sisters, the Dorsey brothers, Glenn Miller, Woody Herman, Gene Krupa, and Louis Armstrong et al. Finally, boarding school at age six, where my parents shared me with 10 years and the Dominican sisters in Westchester County. After getting my BA in theater, I got my MRS, as they said in the 50s. Married my college sweetheart, Andy, who was not an actor. And we had four, count them, four great kids in five years. This particular chapter is centered on two shows that I performed in during 1975. The last one being Rogers and Hart, my third Broadway show. It was this experience that connected me forever to the incomparable music of Richard Rogers and Lorenz Hart. Most of you know Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein, the songwriting duo who changed forever America's theater with their legendary musicals, Oklahoma, Carousel, The King and I, South Pacific, The Sound of Music. But Mr. Rogers' very first partner, Larry Hart, is actually unknown to many current musical audiences. He was earthy, witty, heartbreaking, impudent, barely five feet tall. He was a melancholy genius who drank too much, but still managed to break through his despair with joy. They both went to Columbia University a few years apart, having grown up one block away from each other in Harlem. While Richard was still in school, they wrote their first show, The Garrick Gaieties, from which came their first major hit, Manhattan. And all during the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they created more than 23 shows together. Well, here are a few of their hits from those musicals to pique your interest for those of you who are not as familiar with them. My Funny Valentine, The Lady is a Tramp, My Romance, Falling in Love with Love, Bewitched, my heart stood still, the lady is a tramp with a song in my heart and on and on. Right now, I'll be reading only from an excerpt as we kind of drop midway into my memoir. But let me begin with one of my favorite Rogers and Hart treasures from the lesser known musical, Betsy. This funny world makes fun of the things that you strive for. This funny world can laugh at the dreams you're alive for. If you're beaten, conceal it. There's no pity for you, for the world cannot feel it. Just keep to yourself, weep to yourself. This funny world can turn right around and forget you. <laughs> it's always sure to roll right along when you're through. If you are broke, you shouldn't mind. It's all a joke 
for you will find this funny world is making fun of you. It was a strange birthday month, February 1975. I had turned 36 years of age and found myself deeply entrenched in singing and studying and working. My kids had to have known how gone I was from my normal mommy concentrations, but you see, I was under the delusion that all things were basically unchanged. For seven straight years, I'd been employed almost constantly, mostly in town, and had already been in two Broadway musicals, Jimmy in 1969 and the revival of The Boyfriend in 1970. I'd also had two long 10-week summer stock tours, Alimony with Mickey Rooney and Company with George Maharis and Vivian Blaine during which the kids and Andy spent Fridays through Mondays with me on the road. The motel life with snack machines and pool adventures and yes, yes, some jumping on the beds. Well, it beat any camp life other children were living through. Andy would take Mondays, my day off, for his vacation. And we'd all drive to the next theater in line where they'd help me settle in before returning to New Jersey. My mother, Rowena, living nearby and still a working comedian, stepped up to the plate for the midweek runs. Everything fit in a pretty good pattern. Working during those early years, I definitely went overboard with not letting our everyday life seem altered. You see, I thought a career was just an addendum, a way of widening my influence in the world, using my talent to change other people's lives, not ours. And bringing in extra money wasn't all bad. We were raising four kids, but, during the school year, <laughs> I was on an impossible express train of cooking, cleaning, shopping, commuting, homework, athletic games, often all wrapped around my eight shows a week. But, you know, I didn't feel it. At 36, I was so young and had established a routine that worked. That never let the priority of my family go to second place on my to-do list. And Andy was always always there to fill in the blanks, ready to take over whenever I asked. The big event calendar on my kitchen wall was marked in four different colored pens to detail what each child's carpool was on a given day. If I wasn't actually doing a show at night, I made sure I drove in three or four carpools, subbing for all the other moms so that when I needed them, they drove for me. I was often on the road from three until 8 p.m., swimming, field hockey, soccer, basketball, baseball, dancing, you get the idea. My energy was never ending in that decade. And I not only thought I'd probably live forever and never get sick, but that I could accomplish any damn thing I wanted to. Because, you know, somehow I did. Where did it come from? I, I have no idea. I don't remember feeling obsessed or driven. My journey was simply real to me. I never questioned how. It just was. Every day I did what was on that list. And when I got home from the theater, I'd cook for the next day and then wrap up individual meals for the family to put into my brand new huge microwave when they got hungry. I figured that way they still got their favorite meals, but just, you know, a little askew. You see, <laughs> I often did my food shopping at 1 a.m. at the 24-hour shop, right? Oh, God, I loved it. Alone and taking my time in each aisle. And it was normal routine for me to scrub the kitchen floor on my knees at 3 a.m. with no one nearby telling me there is an easier, quicker way. And, oh. Of course, spending time with Andy wasn't simple with his nine to five life, but mostly he would go to bed with the kids and then wake up when I waltzed in at midnight. Normally I'd get up and make breakfast and then go right back to bed. Sometimes I admit when I was knocked out from the night before, I'd stay in bed and let them pour their own favorite cereal as long as they paraded into my bedroom so I could check their outfits and hand them lunch money. Looking back at the 1975 photos of Andy Jr. and Laurie and Kay and John, they were 15, 14, 12, and 10. You know, there's little doubt that they could take care of themselves on many levels and they had something I never had, each other. I always did try to be home when school got out, even if it meant double round trips on the suburban bus to New York, when I'd try to fit in a commercial audition in the mornings. You see, it was worth the gamble because during those years I was, 
a classic P and G lady, a Procter and Gamble housewife. I was in my prime, best body, best voice, best focus. But you know, I didn't give that a moment's thought. As I said, it just was. There, there wasn't even a big ego at work, just the gift or, or curse of needing to do everything perfectly. The nuns had done a super job. It was a very long time before I understood what a fallacy that perfection goal was. But early in that January winter, I was cast in a strange off-Broadway production playing at the Belmont Plaza Hotel on Lexington Avenue across the street from the iconic Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It was an original musical entitled Be Kind to People Week about New York City in which I played the mayor. And in spite of what I believed to be a mediocre script and worse music, well, like most companies, we bonded early on in the work. It starred an unknown redhead, a former model named Nora Hayden. We worked on the second floor in the grand ballroom. And every lunch hour, a tough looking middle-aged man stepped off the elevator in a gorgeous blonde cashmere overcoat with cigar in hand. And Nora and he would disappear for our break. And it didn't take long for most of us to laugh and figure out who was paying our salaries. You know, I thought at the time he might've owned the Belmont. We also figured out that our show was most likely written by Nora for Nora, because every morning she'd present rewrites and acting notes to all of us saying she had just spoken with the writers, they're in London and they can't get here. And this is what they want done for today from London. <laughs> our director was very patient, but I, dripping sarcasm, marveled to her about the expense of those midnight transatlantic calls. Years before cell phones, long distance was astronomical. And after weeks and weeks of previewing, it was clear she didn't want to open for fear of closing. You see, it just kept going with no end in sight and we couldn't get out of our equity contracts because until we officially opened, we couldn't give our two weeks notice. Oh, I remember thinking I would go absolutely nuts because Unknown to anyone else, I had actually lived at the Belmont Plaza Hotel 25 years previously, the entire summer I was 10 years old. I was snuck into my grandmother Minnie's tiny hotel room there because my mother and dad were in Asia on a nine month post World War II USO tour performing their musical comedy act. They didn't seem to have a problem leaving me all those school months at boarding school and with Minnie all that summer. She was a hostess gown sales lady at J. Thorpe's high-end department store on 57th Street. And I know she didn't enjoy sharing her small bed. She worked hard all day and drank most nights away. Well, I learned to cook dinner on a two burner in the bathroom so that aromas wouldn't escape into the hall. Most nights I tried beef stew, simple chicken soup, and I'd walk to another floor to get rid of the garbage so no one would catch us. Cooking was illegal, as was I, but we never got a hard time from anyone about either misdemeanor. Ah, but breakfast, oh, <laughs> every single morning, sneaking downstairs all alone to the Belmont Corner coffee shop, I'd sit and twirl on the chrome metal stools with the green stripes and order freshly squeezed orange juice and Thomas's English muffins and watch them pop up right in front of me as the counterman would catch them in midair from the toaster. He'd slather fresh butter all over, platter them and hand them to me with his big smile. The nooks and crannies offered delicious expectations that always excited me. And though he never asked my name, I knew him and he knew me and I wasn't alone. To this very day, <laughs> it's my breakfast comfort food. How did I spend the rest of my day in that 10 year old summer? I do remember dreaming in the Waldorf lobby, sitting in the huge wing chairs, roaming the Peacock Alley, counting the tall potted palms and washing up in that most elegant ladies room with real towels, watching as so many beautifully dressed people just kind of wandered in and out and about you see, Eloise had nothing on me. And I, I did roam a lot on Central Park South 
from Columbus Circle down to Fifth Avenue, since my grandmother was so nearby there on 57th Street. And though I was forbidden to ever visit her inside Jay Thorpe's, <laughs> I stayed in the neighborhood for, well, hours, sunning on the rocks in the park, wishing I was on those horse and buggy rides and spending many happy hours playing with a few nickels at the nearby magical world of Horn and Hardart. Oh boy, there were lion's heads spewing forth hot cocoa and turning glass trays, bringing me beautiful mystery pies. You know, it's odd that no one ever approached a 10 year old to find out what she was doing alone, but I have no memory of anyone ever asking about my whereabouts or wondering if my parents were nearby. <laughs> wow, such a different world then. So my 1975 Belmont Hotel aversion got more obnoxious as the weeks went into months. And I, I didn't hold to our leading lady's premise of being kind. I would needle her about never meeting the creative people, always questioning the endless rewrites. Listen. Why wouldn't she want to get rid of me? I would want to get rid of me. Honest to God, her life wasn't my business and I had no right to judge her or her talent. I think I just had a, a desperate neurotic need to get out of that particular hotel. And, and so it came to pass one payday, there it was, a pink slip with my paycheck with no comment. I wasn't prepared and for a tiny moment, my pride was hit, but I was honestly surprised since I had been longing for a way out for weeks. I was actually pretty thrilled. And I have never been back to the Belmont Plaza in 45 years, even into its lobby. And nota bene, Be Kind to People Week finally opened after nine weeks of previews to embarrassing reviews and no newspaper ever gave credit to any composer or a writer. Well, throughout this time, I had been studying with Ron Claremont, a brilliant pianist and voice coach who believed I was someone special, an artist. No one had ever called me that before. Walking on air down West 55th after my hour with him, I would feel worthy, empowered. I was comfortable in that tiny chic apartment with that Steinway grand and even grander goals. The very first session I went to after being fired, he asked if I knew anything about Rogers and Hart. <laughs> Are you kidding? I grew up with Rogers and Hart. I love them. No, he said, I mean, the new Broadway show that Bershevlov is putting together. You know him, he, he won the Tony directing No, 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 Net. And he wrote, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Listen, you must be seen. It's a review thing, but it's you. This is your music, your lyrics. Larry Hart wrote for you. Get your agent to get the audition and well, we'll work on some numbers. Michael Thomas was my agent and then he tried, but we couldn't get the call. Nobody connected with it knew me and besides, I was thought to be too young, too old at 36. You see, the concept was to hire very young gifted couples in their 20s, like most of the characters in the Rogers and Hart stories. But they felt they needed one older couple to interpret Mr. Hart's worldwide lyrics and had already offered the mail role to Larry Guitard, known for his recent Count Magnus in A Little Night Music. But my mentor and friend Ron was relentless. He knew the conductor, Buster Davis, really well. And well, he called him at my next session. Buster, listen, I'm working with someone that you and Bert must see for this review. Oh, we've pretty well decided on our older gal, Ron. He said, you did some Virginia vest off. You see, she was a beautiful actress and a singer who was the original Abigail Adams in 1776. Uh, Ron said, don't offer it to anyone yet. Just bring my lady in for 10 minutes. You'll thank me. Well, you've probably guessed the end of this saga. Later that week, I auditioned at the Helen Hayes Theater on 46th Street. I can't remember the first song I sang, no doubt it was, you know, a belty thing or, but my second one was a favorite Jerome Kern ballad. 
Don't ever leave me. Quiet, sweet silence. Should I leave the stage? Oh dear, what's happening? A man walked down in the dark aisle to the apron and looked at me and quietly said in a deep gravelly voice, here's something. That's when I met Bert Shevloff. I knew I had that job. I felt my audition was particularly special because of feeling so suffocated throughout the winter in that second floor ballroom. I was mentally ready to fly to Broadway with my get out of jail card from that 49th Street Hotel. And lo and behold, within two weeks, there I was in rehearsal, cross town on 46th Street at the Helen A's, just six blocks to a new world. It happened so quickly, almost too easily. My second meeting with Bert was the first day of rehearsal in March. He was our director and from the very beginning, I was in awe of him. As in movies, our rehearsals were actually in the very space in which we would perform, the original Helen Hayes Theater. Completing that Hollywood picture, Bert even wore an ascot to the rehearsal. He embraced us all like a father in what would come to feel like our home, so safe. My joy was overwhelming that day. Not only was it thrilling to get ready to sing Rogers and Hart on Broadway with a company that seemed fabulous, I was alongside a man who knew everything there was to know about their music. In fact, well, he seemed to know everything about my entire world of music. With an aura of wise genius surrounding him, I wanted to sit at his feet to just listen, but I had to act with more sophistication. <laughs> You see, my parents didn't have that deep understanding of how the music masters created, but Bert knew it all. He was about to give us the inside track of two of the most gifted songwriters in American history. Had I been singing Tosca, it kind of would have been like hanging out with the Puccini and pals. He described himself to us that day as a William Goldman character. Goldman, a superb screenwriter, had just written the in-depth best-selling book, The Season, the history of one Broadway season in which he analyzed the most important person in every production that year. In my Rashomon world, I remembered Bert telling us he was a Goldman guru and he could handle anything. But rereading this book recently, I discovered the actual chapter that Bert referred to was called The Muscle. And reference came back as he actually told us. I am not just your director. I am Goldman's muscle. I stand respons responsible for every choice and you can trust me, period. And I did. William Goldman wrote, quote, being the muscle is the most prized status you can have on Broadway because it is the only way you can possibly achieve total satisfaction. Productions are literally struggles for power little wars, if you will. And the battle isn't waged over real estate or wealth, but over whose vision gets up there. Someone has to dominate. Only the muscle has the chance to be fulfilled. Everybody else's vision dies somewhere along the way. And that is why it is probably not too dramatic a thing to say each and every Broadway show is in reality a little battle to the death, unquote. Ah, but the truly unforgettable moment came toward the end of that first amazing rehearsal day. Mr. Rogers came to the stage and we were each introduced. Richard Rogers. I was actually looking at him in person as his nerves stood ready by his side. He had survived a laryngectomy from a bout with cancer, yet you now he seemed full of energy, smiling, expectant with no apology in his effort and with no sentimentality. With his special technique of burping, he spoke to all of us about the importance of this project to him. Richard Rogers met Larry Hart at Columbia University and this was the music of his youth. Like a first deep love, he glowed when he spoke of it. With a song in my heart, heaven opened 
its portal to me, that wonderful March day. And we were to be the final production in that theater before it was completely torn down to make room for an extra large new Broadway house, the Marquis Theater, with an extra large hotel built on top of that, the Marriott Marquis. In addition, we were to be the last Broadway musical that had no amplification whatsoever, not even floor or fly mics. Our orchestra would only be 12 pieces, so as not to overpower the natural voices, much the same blend like the musicals had been in the 30s. It was quite an accomplishment, and I'm still proud of it compared to being so completely mic'd up today. Of the more than 200 songs that Rogers and Hart had composed, we were to sing 99 in medleys and duets and solos, rarely finishing in the normal fashion that would allow applause. You see, Bert believed the songs were the stars. Our real dressing rooms were assigned right from the start. And because we were on Equity's favorite nations contract for the entire company, $500 per week was the salary for a Broadway musical. Everything was alphabetically determined, including the billing. And guess what? My name being A, Andres, meant I got the dressing room number one, right off the left wing. Usually deemed the star dressing room because of its convenience to the stage. Jamie Donnelly was the next woman in the alphabet, and so we shared. I can still see her infectious, wide open smile as an answer to almost everything. She didn't have a negative bone in her body. Having been in the original Broadway show and movie of Greece, she had just closed in Broadway's Rocky Horror Show, creating Magenta. So I immediately scotch taped the many pictures of my loved ones on half of the mirror. I placed my brand new makeup on the hand embroidered towel alongside the bone china teacup, the water for drinking glass, and I hung my special dressing gown, everything in place for my home away from. Beautiful. The nesting came directly from my vaudeville youth. Well, then Jamie gave me her warm reception. Four kids, oh my, wow. So much stuff, Barbara, oh my God. Proper lady, so great. And then she put her toothpaste and hairbrush down on the paper towel and flashed that smile. We were perfect roommates, you know, but nothing is perfect. <laughs> During our six rehearsal weeks, six, two of the original men were fired. The first one came three days into rehearsal. PJ Benjamin, a triple threat, big talent. Boom, gone. He just wasn't there one morning and we were told it was mutual. <laughs> Jimmy Litton came in and sat in his chair. The second firing was some weeks later. At the top of rehearsal one morning, Bert just said that well, Scott Stevenson was no longer with us and David James Carroll would now be joining us. That darling, gorgeous guy walked out of the wings and began a rehearsal day wherein he knew every one of Scott's songs. Clearly, David had been working for a while in secret while Scott had no idea he would be fired. Creepy, sorrowful, devious. And for several days after rehearsals would end, the house lights came up and we could see Scott in the rear balcony just sitting there watching. No one talked to him. We all seemed to just ignore that he was ever with us. I felt really nervous. Somehow our family was no longer safe. Fortunately, David James was a wonderful actor with a beautiful lyrical baritone and was right at home. But Mr. Rogers continued to visit our rehearsals two or three times a week, sitting in the back of the orchestra for hours, often with his wife, Dorothy. Every now and then, while well, we all held our breath, he would go into the pit and play the piano to clarify a rhythm or make clear the pitch of a note that we were missing. Oh, thrilling, unforgettable. And almost immediately, Bert started to treat me as a special star in waiting. He would take Larry and I to Sardi's for our dinner break. We were the 36 year olds sweetly dubbed the Jades by our conductor Buster. But 
he ordered, Bert ordered, my costumes to be handmade, while every other woman had store-bought. Though it was very seductive to be so embraced by him, I felt guilty because I really did want to be an equal company member of favored nation. With no illusions of stardom, I believed as Bert that this great music was the real star of our show. And it was his choice to not list any cast names to a tune, to cut through musically to the next number without an equal ending or an actual ending, to carry over the segue so that the audience would ever applaud the specific moment or actor, but keep on being surprised. However, when he purposely gave me two solos that were great songs and reasonably unknown, he said, here's my gift, Barbara. I want you to have these. You'll finish them. And I began to dream on the suburban bus ride back and forth to North Brunswick. Maybe I could make starry waves. After all, I believed I was meant to bring this music to life. Yet I never allowed myself to talk of all this out loud. I think on one level, I was stressed it might happen. My heart knew that there was no way the family would remain the way I needed them to be if, if I crossed into that world. It would take me years to realize some answers to this problem. You see, our musical was in the slave labor days of equity actors production contract that controls all Broadway shows, which at that time allowed for a rehearsal show day to work 10 out of 12 hours every day for 21 straight days until the first preview occurred in or out of town, no days off. And even after the first preview, 10 out of 12 could continue until the official opening night. Well, you know, thank God by the 1990s, our union finally changed the rules to limit the 10 out of 12 days and even allow for one day off a week. But this was my third Broadway show. And it was the first time that I recall being so exhausted from the regimen. My days being extended by the New Jersey commute had always been there, but the stress of my darling children being older and not seeing me enough, it, it got to me. And I'm sure the idea that Bert was laundering me, <laughs> launching me into something that might change my life scared me to death. But as I kept trucking along, I dreamt of more sleep, not stardom. I was no longer invincible. On about the 20th day of 10 out of 12 days, two days from our first preview, I felt I was losing my voice. My you know, classic neurotic singer. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't have a cold, but my cords were just as exhausted as the rest of my body. And I asked Bert if I could walk through some of the tech rehearsal and you know, not sing full out. He offered me a little yellow pill from his famous BS engraved gold pill box that he always had in his hand. It was the first value I'd ever seen. And when I politely refused, he said, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. And he let me mouth my songs. But something happened then. I, I think he lost faith in me. And at the top of our first dress rehearsal, he walked down the aisle and he thrust his hand toward me in the spotlight announcing, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I give you the theater of the deaf. The next night at midnight, instead of releasing us, they called for a two hour overtime. It was actually legal. And so on our final day of three straight weeks of 12 hour days, we actually worked 14. I remember they brought in sandwiches, which none of us could eat. And we all laid flat on our backs across the stage boards for our precious 10 minute break. Of course, one might ask why? I suppose the creators thought we weren't getting it right and maybe figured we'd be so damn tired for that first show that the great choices would flow from us automatically. In fact, miraculously, as often happens, we did have an exciting first preview and Mr. Rogers attended. It had to help that we were all young, even the Jades. And that Friday night was followed by two more good Saturday previews. Finally, finally, we had our first day off in 21 days on Sunday. Oh my God, that was something grand. 
I did nothing all day but speak softly, not sing a note, and hug my family. I looked at Andy and the kids, and I knew our life held something special. Oh, and my voice had been great for the three shows. Since we had just started the previews, all the producers and the creative staff held an important meeting that same Sunday afternoon. They went up to the producer's home in beautiful Connecticut, and I dissected the good, the bad, and the ugly. We had heard, you know, backstage that, you know, they didn't think it was as gone or as good as they had hoped. But selfishly, I was very happy with my stuff. I felt in my bones that connected with the audience, knowing they got what I was thinking and kind of got what I was feeling. I really did belong with Mr. Rogers and Mr. Hart and together we were making people happy. On Monday morning around 10 o'clock, my kitchen wall phone began ringing as I was running to the car and I stopped to answer it. We still had more than a week left of 12 hour preview days before the actual opening night. And to be on time for our noon rehearsal, I had to catch the 1030 Suburban bus to Port Authority. When I heard the company manager, Leonard Soloway's voice, I immediately thought, oh God, I'm gonna miss my bus. Uh, I'm glad I caught you, Barbara. I know you have to come in from New Jersey. <laughs> yes, what is it, Leonard? Because you see, I really do have to catch the bus. <laughs> well, <clears throat> darling, there's been a change. Oh my Lord, did they fire someone? Who could it be? Oh God, I immediately remembered the whole shock of Scott, not now. The show's okay, this could be such a mess. <sighs> Pause. Yes, Leonard, what is it? Well, <clears throat> this is hard. What is? Is someone being replaced? Well, yes. Long pause. What do you mean? Strange pause, kind of joking. Is it me? <laughs> well, Yes, it is. A very long pause. Maybe it wasn't so long. Maybe I said this right away. I do know I couldn't believe what I was hearing and it was surreal. But well, you're kidding. Why, you saw my three shows? You know what I was doing up there. What on earth, are, why are you firing me? You've got to give me a reason. Well, darling, you're too seasoned. Too seasoned. What does that mean? This can't be true. Well, I, now I suggest you come in as soon as possible to get your things out of the dressing room as we have a performance tonight and your understudy is gonna to have to go on. No tears, no anger, nothing to register except shock. Oh my God, Leonard, I have so many tickets. What do I do about opening night? Where did that come from? From left field, my dad would say. Oh, don't worry about that. We'll cancel all of them and you'll be getting your two week salary for severance, a thousand dollars. Now, when you come in, just check with me up in front. Really? He was gone. I hung up. The first person I called was Andy. I still wasn't crying, but I do remember as soon as I tried to explain the phone call to him, I, I started to kind of sob and speak at the same time. He was at work in the New York City office at Chemical Bank where he had just started a new job. He immediately offered, should I come home? No, I've got to come into the city to pick up my stuff up. I'll call you when I'm there. I've just got to get myself together. Oh God, Andy, I really was good in it. I wish you had seen me. I wish someone had seen me. I think I called my agent next, but honestly, I was finally crying so hard the order of stuff is bleary. I know he said all the right things. We know you're wonderful. This too will pass. It's shocking. We'll talk later, try to remain calm. But it felt like someone had died. I didn't recognize the room I was in. 
My mother, Rowena, lived three miles down the road from us in North Brunswick and had been so involved helping with the kids throughout all the rehearsals. I, I suddenly felt an urgent need to call her. My telling her what happened allowed me to stop crying finally. <laughs> Somehow I knew she got it, this killer business. And as I ranted about the news and how I couldn't believe it, and how I was now having to go into the city, to the theater, to somehow put an end to it. She just said quietly, you're not going anywhere. Oh, Mom, I've got to get this over with. I am done. The sooner the better. <laughs> you're going to wait until the kids come home from school. And then you put them in the car. You can come pick me up and we'll all drive into the city together. I'll stay with the car and you go into that dressing room with your wonderful children and let them help you pack up your grip. They need to see what's happening and you need to understand what matters in your life. Forget that damn show. You are the mother of four incredible human beings. Face that. You have Andy. He can meet us. I knew instantly how right she was. I would never feel the depth of that rejection again. I would go on to have many more disappointments, even failures, but I would never let the Leonard Soloways bring me quite so low again. I had a life. So at 3.30 PM, the six of us left in the station wagon to get to 46th Street. The trip was about an hour. And I decided while driving to sing the On Your Toes song that I had intended to mentally dedicate to my mom on opening night. She'd never have the chance to hear it in the middle of the second act now. So I sang it in the middle of negotiating the New Jersey Turnpike. It was tough. And we both were very quiet for a long time when I finished. This 36 year old woman still searching for a way to unconditionally embrace her 59 year old, lonely, four times married, jealous mother. I didn't have great lighting or 12 musicians in the pit, but that Rogers and Hart number was never more embraced. Dear old mother was as wise as 10 folks. And she knew her way about the men folks. So oh, once she said to me, daughter, you're quite a pup. Daughter, dear, it's time to wise you up. She said, love will always be my hoodoo. Though I've lived, uh, I know no more than you do. Mother told me, there's no use asking why. He loves she and she loves he. The heart is quicker and the eye. In December 45, mother got a little snootful. In September 46, I was born alive and beautiful. I recall a few years later, I was taken with the measles and my darling little mater. She sat up all night with a good looking guy. <laughs> oh me, oh my, we would travel quite a lot but we always went to Reno. She'd remarry like a shot, not for long, but how could she know? Number four was a musician. He could play it sweet and hot. Whistler's mother was a classic. Mother's Whistler was not. He was dropped like the rest. Mother always knew best. Mother begged me, don't drink with any guy. So I was made on lemonade. The heart is quicker than the rye. Oh, the kids and I had to quietly sneak into a tight passage to get to the stage door at the end of the alleyway. I had instructed them to keep absolutely silence because once inside, we had to cross upstage to get to my dressing room off stage left while the cast would be rehearsing my numbers on stage with my understudy for the entire walk. 
the more I tried to block it away, the more the tears came and we finally got to the room. And my darling children were so upset asking what's wrong, mommy, what's happening? I kept trying to explain whisper like that this was where I had been working, singing and dancing all that time away from home. And it was sad for me to hear the music on the stage, but that it would be okay. As soon as we got all my stuff, we'd go home and mommy would be with them all the time now. They helped me pack their pictures, my robe, my everything so patiently. I love them so much. Was it okay to let them see my hurt and confusion? I've often wondered how they each remember that day, but never have asked. You know, somehow word got out that I was in the theater. And so the company went on a break. Some came to my room, hugging, a few crying. Jamie was first. Everyone was scared, emotional. If they could fire me, who was next? You could feel that all amongst us. The kids and I found, finally managed to get to the front lobby, lobby when, when Andy arrived. Rowena had parked the car and was waiting at the corner. Howard Johnson's directly across the street where they all went to get ice cream sundaes. And for some reason that meant so much to me. I found Leonard Soloway in the lobby office to talk about opening night, nothing more. It was very clinical, done. My songs were still floating to the back of the house. Opening the lobby door, there was Broadway, the street, actually staring at me as I went into Howard Johnson's. I tried eating some chocolate ice cream, but I so needed to leave 46th Street. That Monday night, I cried myself to sleep. I was really depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. Next morning, the kids came in before leaving for school and hugged and kissed me. Andy hugged and kissed me, but it didn't cure a thing. I just pulled those covers up and kept trying to figure out the emptiness. Even though I was surrounded by love, my soul was bruised. There were no answers that didn't include the lie I had been telling myself for so long. I really wasn't that talented. I should probably see a doctor for all the delusions I held. I had no one to ask, how dare I think I could have it all. <laughs> all the pain my mother and father had felt that I was helpless to fix growing up, no matter how hard I tried. Well, that was now with me in my own gut. Truthfully, it was terribly embarrassing. Facing my failure was cracking my heart. And where was Bert Shevlov? My mentor, my father. He hadn't come near me in the theater when I packed. And I never wanted to sing again, never. But I needed to see Bert. The lyrics of This Funny World, my first act solo, just kept swirling in my brain. This funny world can laugh at the things. I finally understood every word that Larry Hart wrote. I felt his pain. I didn't want this business. And I couldn't get out of bed. The next day on Tuesday afternoon, my darling agent called to suggest I come into town and go to an audition he had for me on, you know, on that Wednesday, get back on the horse. I declined and I said I was quitting the business. He suggested some time away, you know, things like this happen a lot. I might book a trip to Bermuda with Andy and, and just forget this, this terrible turn. I'd never even been to Bermuda but I couldn't take a shower, let alone a bus somewhere, let alone a plane to an island. Oh, why was this hitting me so hard? I think even then I knew it was the realization that life in the arts would always break my heart. And I felt 
so stupid that I had been fooled into believing that wasn't going to be my truth. The bottom line, I felt a fraud, untalented. So many people lying to me except my beloved family. They knew me and loved me unconditionally. In my days, it was an anchor I kept clinging to despite two firings in one year. That night, my youngest son, John, brought a small package to my bed. <laughs> yes, I was still there. He said he had gotten me an opening night gift, and since I wasn't going to be opening, he wanted me to have it now. And on the back of the wrapping paper, he wrote, have fun tonight with Mr. Rogers and Mr. Hart. Love, John. It was a small, beautiful green pottery vase that he knew I would use for dressing room flowers. To this day, glued together after 40 years of wear and tear in many dressing rooms, it sits on my theater shelf with its precious note stuffed inside in place of any posies, priceless. When I woke up with the cover still over my head on Wednesday morning, I realized I needed to turn a corner. I had to get up. The sunny morning brought me some focus. I, my show was doing a matinee. The least I could accomplish was a decent dinner. Get busy, wash my hair, try to cook. My mom had called the night before asking for the name of the producer so she could put some pins in a cloth doll that she was making. <laughs> oh, Rowena. I managed dinner, but I couldn't manage an appetite. The kitchen got clean and the kids were in bed when I fell sound asleep on our den's couch after finishing nearly a bottle of wine. I, I'm sure that Andy only drank one glass. At midnight, the phone rang. Andy came over to wake me because Leonard Soloway wanted to talk to me. What? Oh, ridiculous, it's midnight. Oh, yes, Leonard. I know it's late, Barbara. Sorry. Are you sitting down? No, I've been lying down asleep. What is it? Well, surprise. We want you back. One of those Soloway pauses. Back for what? Well, I just left a company meeting after the show tonight, and we realized we made a mistake. We'd like you to come back into the show. No pause this time. Guess what, Leonard? I never will go back. Not interested. Well, Barbara, please don't make a quick decision. I should tell you, I must tell you what actually happened tonight. Mr. Rogers, who always visits his shows that are playing on Broadway every Wednesday, saw the performance again tonight and asked how you were. Why weren't you on? Are, are you sick? Bert explained that no, you had been replaced. Mr. Rogers then simply tapped his cane and said the show won't open without her and left the theater. So you can see how important this is. Of course. After all, he did own the rights to every note in the show. Could this be? Could, could Mr. Rogers, the man that had never more than a few words with me, the good man who sat in our rehearsals and watched his earliest music be reinterpreted by so many newbies. This man quietly got me. Oh, well, I mean, that's something, Leonard, but you don't get it. I'm not coming back. I've just had an abortion and you're asking me to shove the baby back inside? God, Mr. Rogers understanding what I do? <laughs> well, it's hard not to take that in. Listen, Barbara, you can't decide this quickly. Look at what's in it for you. Take tonight to think about it and we'll talk in the morning. We'll need you to decide so you can go on tomorrow night as we still want to open next week. Oh, you can keep your severance pay. That's good, yes. No. The answer is no. Get a good night's sleep. Please talk to your agent. I'll call you at noon. Well, I did sit down then. I told Andy. He was amazed. I called Rowena 
And before I even said hello, at 1 a.m. in the morning, she said to me, they want you back. Ah, oh, how could you even think that, mother? It doesn't happen that way. Oh, the minute I put the pins in the doll, I knew this would happen. I knew they would need you. <laughs> well, Andy and I sat and talked for two hours or so, not dismissing a thing. All the reasons not to. A few, too. There was still no. I really had left the business. I didn't need it. It wasn't worth the price. I had a life. I was safe. We went to bed. It wasn't long before Andy asked if I was asleep, and I offered, <laughs> probably not on this night. You're making a big mistake, Barbara. In a few years, you'll be standing at the sink, peeling some potatoes and quietly thinking to yourself, what would have happened if I went back? After all, Richard Rogers thought I belonged. But you'll never know the answer. And you'll regret it. Oh, my God. I knew I'd go back. I needed to go back. <laughs> and then I really couldn't sleep. Afraid I wouldn't remember one lyric. But by Thursday late afternoon, after you know, not much negotiations due to the favored nations contract, I drove back to that Helen Hayes Theater on 46th Street singing my songs over and over and over. And oh, of course, rehearsal was in full swing on arrival. This time, my understudy was asked to leave the stage while I had to take her place. Killer business, did I say? I hugged her in the wings. If it helps, I understand what you're feeling right now. I'm sure it didn't help. Once again, before I left for the city, however, Rowena called. I told her I was returning to do the show that night. And she said, when I stood in the wings before my first entrance, you see the, the overture was each cast member individually coming on stage singing a solo musical phrase to the words, Rogers and Hart. She said, when I stood there and I was feeling my most nauseous, most fearful, I must take a deep breath and privately say, this performance is for every actor who ever got fired, who didn't deserve to be and never had the chance to prove it. And that prayer was with me every single night. We were open for more than five months and I stayed for the entire run. At first I thought, you know, I'd get back at everyone and give my two week notice after the reviews, but every now and then I'd hear a single applaud on my solo entrance, usually from the back balcony. And I always felt it was a communion from an actor who had somehow heard my prayer. How dumb it would have been to walk away from the chance to sing those glorious songs each day. <laughs> oh, and on the streets, the antidote ran wild that I got a dollar for every tear I shed. Even though I am known to be an over-the-top crier, they could never have paid me enough. And Bert Shevloff. <laughs> my absent friend who never even looked me in the eye, never said hello or goodbye after my return, who broke my heart, who always gave me my notes via the stage manager so he never had to encounter me in person. He announced in front of the entire cast in his opening night, Newt Rockney talk while looking down at the floor. At the end of the curtain call, Barbara should be the one to go to the wings and escort Mr. Rogers onto the stage for the audience to pay him homage. <clears throat> that night was the first time I'd seen Richard since everything changed. And I could only mouth a silent, tearful, thank you, as I took his arm to lead him to the audience. He gave me the sweetest nod. My funny Valentine. A wonderful development later in September of that year 
was my being cast in the 1976 Richard Rodgers' new Broadway musical, Rex, as Queen Catherine of Aragon. It was a huge production about King Henry VIII and his wives that gave him his children. Sheldon Harnick was the lyricist this time, and he had written Fiddler on the Roof, She Loves Me, so many other major, hit, major hits. Catherine's important song, my song, as once I loved you, was Richard's favorite in that show. And I was, oh God, I was so fortunate to spend many months with him, continuing to learn and love. I have always thanked Dick in the best way I know by singing his incomparable ballads. You know, but even now as I write Dick, it sounds funny in my ear. Though he kept asking me to please call him by his familiar name. He always wrote Love Dick. But somehow Richard remains more natural, respectful for me. Many months after we closed, Donald Sadler, our gifted classy choreographer, whom I adored, got in touch with me to finally tell me what happened at the infamous producers meeting in Connecticut that fateful day after the initial previews. Bert, who took complete responsibility for the entire show, our Mr. Muscle, well, he decided I needed to be out of the mix because I was the one person who seemed to understand Larry Hart's lyrics, who had the right sophistication. He made it clear to all that if I was gone, everyone else would look better. It's my decision. None of you are responsible. Really? <laughs> are you kidding me, Bert? Remember Mr. Goldman? Someone has to dominate. Only the muscle has a chance to be fulfilled. Everybody else's vision dies somewhere along the way. A little battle to the death. The most lasting importance of that life-changing heartbreak was the wisdom of my mother. From that time on, it changed my relationship with her. We never stopped our endless arguments, but there was a new, oh, respect in our relationship. It was um, more loving. I must say that she was never a great role model, but for motherhood especially. But at that time, she saved me as only Rowena could. Dear old mother was as wise as 10 folks. Thank you. Yay. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Barbara. Oh my goodness. That story is wonderful. So many ups and downs, my goodness. I know, in and out and over and out, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> um, so uh, to, our, um, to our audience, if you have a question for Barbara that you would like to ask, please uh, find your way to the chat and enter your question in there. Um, and we will, uh, we will look at at those and take them as they come. Um, Barbara, the- oh, I do want to mention, this is very yes. important. I was a little, um, whatever at the end, <laughs> but uh, remembering my, my wonderful mother, um, we're, I am so blessed and, and very happy. Uh, three of the original cast members of uh, Rogers and Hart are in the uh, wonderful audience tonight, uh, blessed. There may be more, I'm not sure, but I know that Mary Sue Finnerty and Wayne Bryan and um, I think Stephen Lehu are all three here, right? Say yes, all at <laughs> once if it's true. And I'm not sure about the others. It could be Larry Guitard or it could be David Tomei. I was told how yes, wonderful. I'm here. I'm here. Hi, Mary Sue. Hi, darling. Oh, God. You were like my big sister who took me through all of this. This was my Broadway debut. All right. You were my favorite person. You took care of me, my sister, all of us. You um, look as beautiful as ever, Mary Sue. I got to tell you. <laughs> well, 
2020 brought me to being 70 and a grandma of two babies. And I have a 15 year old grandchild. And I always thought of you with your children and how you cared for them and how you honored the theater. And then I'll stop. Your son was graduating, but you said you never miss a performance. And you went to your performance and met up with your family later when Andy was graduating from high school. And I found that truly amazing. I don't remember that. I remember always being conflicted at graduations and most of them, thank God I made, but I, I, know, I have no doubt that that happened because- um, It happened uh, and, and um, I can't wait till we can get together and my husband, just so you all know, did summer stock with her mother, Rowena. So <laughs> That's right, I remember. We all had lots of stories to tell when we got together and we'll get together soon. This was beautiful, bringing back memories for me. Oh my God, oh my God. But yeah, it's kind of like yesterday and yet it's like a century ago. It's, it's a very complicated uh, memory for me. It's been that way writing all the shows. I haven't written all the shows yet, but when I go back to uh, try to piece together what might be the real memory, I have to be as careful as I can be that I don't romanticize anything, that I just try to remember exactly what went on. Well, so. we'll get together and probably say a lot more, but I love you. This was so wonderful. I'm so happy to see you. I love you too, darling. I really do. So we'll get Fighting. together soon. Congratulations. This was fabulous. No, oh, thanks. Hey, Wayne, I'd are like, you there? Yes, I'd like to say hi too, if they let me uh, turn on the video. Oh yeah. I have to get permission here. But, oh, there we go. Barbara, that oh, was- Hi, darling. <laughs> Mary Sue, it was so great seeing you too. What a complete treat. And uh, Barbara, you're just such a compelling storyteller that was just really thrilling from start to finish. It was such a great performance piece in itself, but it brought back so many memories of that time period. Many things like Mary Sue, I suspect I had forgotten. And of course, it's like Rashomon. Each of us has our own take on what was happening in that room at those times and uh but it i thought everything you said rang so true and oh, was so you. acutely observed and uh, i just loved hearing all of it so thanks for sharing that today it's quite wonderful well you knew all the the tough details of it so you just were kind of on board for the uh build-up so to speak <laughs> <laughs> it was a really um uh, life-changing time for me Sure. So, Barbara, the, someone in the chat has asking um, about the story of uh, loving the stories of your childhood, uh, and is is that are those stories included in your memoir? Oh yes, oh yes. What actually started out initially some couple of years ago when I started wanting to write um, about what's been a fairly long life so far. Uh, what is most fascinating in many ways for people who might be reading is I had a very unusual childhood and um, and the very fact that I um, I really was raised, so to speak, to go into the business like a lawyer, a young kid might be raised in a lawyer's family to become a lawyer. I, in many ways, my mom and dad expected me to go directly onto that stage. And uh, because it's all I knew for the first six years of my life. And uh, so was, am I writing about it? Yes, it's, it's certainly the beginning of everything, primarily because my initial thrust on this book was to tell my mother's story and somewhat my dad's, but my mother's an extraordinary, extraordinary force and woman in her very talented life and uh, needs, it still needs to be very much uh, shared with uh, the world, so to speak. And so I started out wanting it to be my mom's journey and what came in through ever the telling of it about my life was gonna be cool. As it turned out, I, I, it was so much easier for me to write about my years. And as I remembered my own specific goods and bads of being in the business. And so that came first and still is most of what 
my writing is right now, although I have, um, oh, I just have boxes and boxes about my mom. So in the beginning of what will hopefully someday be the book, uh, it will be a great deal about my mom and dad and me uh, kind of uh, flitting about during World War II with these two people who never stopped loving being on that stage and doing their you know, 12 minute act. It was uh, an amazing experience to be part of. It doesn't really exist so much anymore today. That's another reason why uh, that story is somewhat important to tell because young people in the business have no concept of that kind of adoration of work on vaudevillians parts. Um, it's what they did for 20 years, seven minutes of jokes or you know, 24 minutes of acrobatic turns, whatever. My mom and dad happened to be headliners. And so they were lucky enough to, you know, lucky enough to be toward the end of the, the um, show. So that when I would sit in the box seats and watch, I had to watch until my mom and dad came on because I was interested in all the front acts. And then I would kind of usually leave right after my mom and dad came on in the 11 o'clock spot or whatever. But um, they were comedy ballroom dancers, uh, both of them. My father was a hoofer, natural, didn't train at all, danced on the streets of Chicago. And my mother was a very trained dancer. So it helped that he could kind of, she could rather keep my father in tow when they did their act by the discipline of what she knew how to do. Uh, but a very, very funny lady. So yes, my book will be about my early years. It has to be. You wouldn't begin to understand. Just I had a lot of trouble with keeping the first show in tonight's reading, although it was in my chapter, because I was afraid it wouldn't hold uh, an interest, particularly with an audience. But it was very important to me as the uh, understanding what the second firing meant to me. And um, I didn't think I could cut it and have the same impact. So I kept it. But yes, the beginning will be how to figure out the journey. God, we all have this journey. We all have the beginning, the middle, and somewhat the end. My husband and I are going that uh, road a little bit. So we just welcomed our great first great grandchild. So I feel like I'm on the other side of the mountain. <laughs> oh, one of the one of our um, audience members, uh, Carol, says, "I currently have teenagers." and times have changed indeed, but how did you get them to drive to the theater that night? Oh, well, you know, they were very involved with um, my work. I mean, they had to be, I had to, I had to have them be involved in my work. And, uh, you know, we would talk about it all the time and they knew what I was doing, that I was, you know, getting on that bus or getting in the car, mostly on the suburban bus line. But um, it wasn't hard since, you know, they knew when, I, when I'm upset to this day, Everybody knows it. I don't even have to be crying. And it's like, oh God, look at her. You know, I, I, I sure that they all knew that uh, when they came in from school, though that wasn't the norm, and they were going to probably miss some athletic practices by our driving into the city. It was important if they saw their grandmother and me say, "Get in the car, we're going to New York," and it would be explained as soon as it could be. You know, they they didn't question me. Um, thank God. I mean, sometimes they did, obviously, but I mean. Uh, it was a different time and, and teenagers weren't that rebellious. If I was lucky, I think maybe, I don't know. Our kids weren't that rebellious that I would have never allowed for them, for instance, to say, I'm not going <laughs> to get in the car. <laughs> so uh, that's the way it was then. Just like nobody knew why I was alone when I was 10 years old that whole summer. That was incre incredible. That would no more happen today. I would be picked up by you know, four policemen probably in one day. So but no one ever asked me anything. Yeah. Um, Jack and Barbara say another fascinating aspect is this dual life set against 1970s women's movement and the radical idea of then raising children while holding down a full-time job. That's right. Um, the interesting thing about that was my very first show, show on Broadway was in 1969. This is, this is also in another chapter, but still, it's very um, fabulous to remember that we lived on a suburban street with the four kids, Andy and I, in North Brunswick. And um, I had not worked like full time until I decided it was time. My baby was going into kindergarten and I just wanted to be in a show, you know? So make a long story short, there was no 
woman on that street, maybe 12 houses on that street, maybe a little more that had a job, not one, including myself. And um, so I just courageously and dumbly, whatever you want to call it, went into New York at one point that, that spring of 1969. And I went to the first open equity call. I was already equity. And uh, it make a little sure I got in the, I got in the, the course and it was amazing. There were almost 300 people that the first call. And I came home that day and said to Andy, oh my God, I, I, I just been hired. In, I had to go to a callback, of course, but they want me to do this Broadway show. It's a Broadway show. I, I don't want to be in the chorus, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, take it. And I did. So I came back onto that suburban street, like in June, July. And the news spread wildly that this suburban mother of four was in a Broadway show. Well, no one. I mean, no one, not only could they not believe it or why, or where would this be coming from and would ask me outrageous questions, but some of them truly looked upon me as a wanton kind of mother and wife, you know, like how could you leave four children and do eight shows a week? Well, I wasn't even able to answer that question, but I knew at the time I would figure it out and we did. But it was interesting that within three years, about three years, I was still in that house before we moved to another house. And I would say eight out of the 12 houses, the women were working. So there was a huge, they were, you know, doing different jobs in the libraries, teaching, whatever. But the fact is that the change for women happened enormously during those three years and very telling. And I just happened to be at the front line of it. Mm -hmm. So marvelous. I'm reading through all of these, you know, bravo, bravo, Nana. Uh -huh. oh, those are my babies, <laughs> my grandbabies. Thank you, darlings. Talk <laughs> later. John Diaz, our artistic director, is in the audience saying exactly the sort of uplift we all need right now. Thanks, dear Barbara. Oh, thank you, John. What a wonderful man he is. All of you who are subscribers know, right? Sure, wonderful, sure. wonderful artistic director. God bless you. Well, um, I think, I mean, there are, there are some questions here about, I mean, people are very interested in your, in your memoir. So um, they're interested, I know, right? So. Um, <laughs> I keep writing, I guess. Okay. I guess so, I, I guess so. I mean, that's one of the things you wanted to, to learn through this. One evening. of the reasons I was very anxious to read this. It's very odd to read for me, my own writing. You know, I'd rather be reading a playwright, obviously, mm -hmm. but. Um, the truth is that I, I wanted it as a kind of a, a, a test as to whether people would be held and interested in my stories. It seems that that's, that's there. It's good. It is. So I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you to River for absolutely. There. Thank um, you so much. Well, it, did Stephen Lay you ever come on? I didn't hear him. I just want to say hi. Are you there, Stephen? He's one of the original cast members. Ah. Um, I think he's hiding. He's hiding? <laughs> Is that you, Mary Sue? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, Stephen, don't hide, but I understand if you want to. Um, I love you. And I'm very, very happy that you were with us tonight, with me tonight. I, I hope, like Mary Sue promised, we will be getting together soon. Lovely. This All was right. the, best, the best. Love to your family. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Barbara, I think I, I think we're at time. Thank you Great. so much. Thank all of you, everyone, uh, off the camera, on the camera, behind the camera, <laughs> and in all the little squares that I never really got to appreciate. But I really do appreciate your listening. Thank you. Definitely. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, bye -bye. Barbara. You're lovely. Thank you. <laughs>